Charles Dickens' classic tale, Tale of Two Cities, starts off with the phrase, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. Uh, 1990, I moved from Chicago with my family to uh, L.A. to seek my fame and fortune. And uh, in a couple of weeks of being there, I got two important phone calls. One was from the talent coordinator for The Tonight Show, uh, offering me the, to, to have a spot as a comedian uh, on tonight's show. And the second call was that uh, my daughter's doctor had called up to say that her cancer had resurfaced. For that next year, um, my life was pretty surreal because it's like two different personalities. During the day, in order to keep my daughter at home with me, I would have to learn CPR and uh, how to work a heart monitor and administer medicine, all these technical terms, and take her back and forth to get uh, her platelets and blood and check up on her. And at night, I would go from club to club with the talent coordinator and I would work on my set. And, uh, and I thought that everything was great because we had beat the cancer before we could beat it again. And this was the first time that I was gonna be in front of millions of people on The Tonight Show. The first time on The Tonight Show, I was extremely nervous. All I could think about while I was backstage being introduced was, don't mess up, just don't mess up. Whatever you do, don't mess up. And the curtains open and there's 600 people and the cameras and Johnny's over there and the band is over there. And I don't know what I said for the next six minutes, <laughs> but I got six applause breaks. And uh, the great part of that night was that uh, I was going to my car and I met Johnny who was going to his car and it was just a private moment between us in the parking lot of him saying, you were very funny. You're extremely funny. Start working on your second Tonight Show because I want you back. Family is very important to me. I'm a father myself. And I think the biggest ordeal of having children is the pregnancy. My wife went through so many mood changes. One minute she would say things like, honey, I love you. You're so special. You're my rock of Gibraltar. And the next minute she would shout, how the hell can I sleep if you're going to keep on breathing? <laughs> That's exactly what she told me. She couldn't sleep because she could hear me constantly intaking air. Yeah. And the week before the labor, she could hear me blink. <laughs> I said, baby, the only way we're not blinking is if I'm dead. And she looked at me and said, yeah, so what's your point? Yeah. <laughs> In fact, I was sleeping one night and I felt the room become stuffy. Come to find out why it was because a pillow had been placed over my head. Yeah. <laughs> With Velcro. <laughs> Thank you. And I was fortunate to be at the labor. I took my Lamaze classes, which worked great during the labor itself, because while she was screaming in pain, I was in the corner going, <laughs> <laughs> hey, that does work. You OK, baby? <laughs> Can you hear me breathe now? <laughs> I don't see what the problem is. And the labor only took 30 minutes. It was unbelievable. It was like giving birth to a Domino's pizza. You know? <laughs> By the time I got the official call for my second Tonight Show, my daughter my daughter was admitted to the hospital. Um, if you don't know about cancer, when it comes back, it comes back hard. It's like beating up a game banger for the first time, and then it's coming back, and he's coming back meaner and stronger, and he's coming with his friends. So in order to compensate for that, you have to raise the chemo, and you have to raise the medicine, and you have to raise the radiation, which is difficult for an adult. An adult, but she was only two. 
You're not prepared for this. There's no books. There's no home ed class to teach you how to deal with this. And you can't go to a therapist because in the black world, a therapist is taboo. It's reserved for rich white people. So you're trying to figure it out. What did I do? Maybe it's something I did. Maybe it's something my wife did. Maybe my doctor uh, diagnosed it uh, erroneously something. But at night, I still have to be a comic. I have to work on a Tonight Show because that's what I'm going to do. I'm a clown. I'm a clown whose medical bills are raising, who's uh, one step from being evicted, who's one step from getting his car repoed, and I have to come out and make you laugh because no one wants to hear the clown in pain because that's not funny. And my, my humor is being, becoming dark and it's biting and it's becoming hateful and the talent coordinator is seeing that there's a problem because the NBC is all about nice and just everything is going to be okay and we're starting to buck horns because he wants everything light and I want to be honest and tell life and I'm hurting and I want everybody else to hurt because somebody is to blame for this. So I buck up and I suppress my anger, and I form and develop a nice, cute routine for the second Tonight Show, and I get applause breaks, and I get asked to come back for a third time. And I always got into a lot of trouble growing up, because up until I was five, my mother was cross-eyed, you know? And I never knew what cross-eyed meant at the age of five. All I knew is that whenever she would yell, come here, i look up, see she wasn't looking directly at me, so I would just go about my business, you know? <laughs> and she would confuse the whole family, not just me. Once we were all in a department store, and she said, come here, boy. And I looked up, and I saw one eye focused over my head, and the other eye going to the left. So I turned to my brother and said, Danny, mama's calling you. But from Danny's perspective, one eye was going over his head, and the other eye was going to the right, so he said, uh-uh, she calling you. Even the security guard at the store looked at my mother and went, are you talking to me, man? <laughs> and she started shouting at me, how come you ain't coming I call? Mama, I didn't know who you were talking to. Who you think I was talking to, that girl over there? Now I'm really lost because she's looking left, she's pointing right, and there's not a girl in the store. You know? <laughs> And I'm begging her, what girl, mama? The girl over there, what girl? The girl over there in that store across the street behind that pole on the second floor sitting down brushing her hair. <laughs> now, if you got something wrong with your eyes, boy, you let me know and I'll take you to a proctologist. <laughs> Why a proctologist? So I can get my foot out your behind from causing me so much aggravation. my third set and the doctor asked me to come in and I know something's wrong because even the doctor is crying and doctors don't cry and he said that we've done all we can there's nothing else for us to do and I said how much time does she have and he said at the most at the most, six weeks, and I should plan for that. And I'm thinking, how do I plan for that? I haven't planned to buy her her first bicycle. I haven't planned to walk her to school. I haven't planned to take pictures of her on her prom. I haven't planned to walk her down the aisle to get married. How am I going to plan to buy her a dress to be buried in? 
and I'm trying to keep it together because I'm the man and I'm the, the man in the house and I don't want to cry but it's coming and I'm trying to tell my way, tell myself, Tony, I'm trying to beg the world, just, just, just give me a chance, just, just give me chances. Just, just let me take a breath, just stop just for a minute. I want to call my parents and tell them what do I do. I, I don't know what to do. I'm a grown man, and I don't know what to do. And a man, a voice in me comes up like Denzel from training day. Man up, nigga! You think you're the only one losing kids today? 25 kids walked in here with cancer, only five walking out. This ain't no sitcom. It don't wrap up all nice and tidy in 30 minutes. This is life. Welcome to the real world. And he was right. So I bucked up because that's what I'm supposed to do. And on my third Tonight Show, by that time, my daughter had died. And I had six applause breaks that night. No one knew I was mourning. No one knew that I could care less about the Tonight Show or Johnny Carson. collectors after me as it is. I have so many bill collectors after me, when they come to my house, they carpool. You know? <laughs> but I drove out here from Chicago, bought a Honda Accord right before I left. And I was afraid at first to buy the Honda because of the way it was presented to me by the salesman. You know, the salesman would say things like, check out the trunk space. <laughs> you notice how big that is? Now, let's say, for instance, you were to, um, well, I don't know, um, <laughs> shoot your wife in the face. <laughs> Just as an example. All right. Now, with the Honda, you can place your wife's body in the trunk, yet still have room enough for your golf clubs. You know? <laughs> and I rush home all excited, honey, I bought a car, Honda Accord. Honda? What the hell you buy a Honda for? Of all the American cars you could have got, what made your big knucklehead buy a Honda? Trunk space. <laughs> In 1990, I had three appearances with the legendary Johnny Carson and a total of 14 applause breaks. And I would have given it all if I could just have one more day sharing a bag of french fries with my daughter. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Thank you.